Well, now that we've heard the message, I think we could leave. I want to read to you from the message, the third chapter of John, verses 1 through 21, just as a reinforcement to what we've, we've already seen up here. There was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. Late one night, he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher straight from God. No one could do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if God weren't in it. Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and grown up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying, this brain, this, this born from above talk? Jesus said, you're not listening. Let me say it again. <clears throat> Unless a person submits to the original, to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into a new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. When you look at a baby, it's just that, a body. You can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within it is formed by something you can't see and touch, the spirit, and becomes a living spirit. So don't be surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above, by the wind of God, the Spirit of God. Nicodemus asked, what do you mean by this? How does this happen? Jesus said, you're a respected teacher of Israel and you don't know these basics. Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak only of what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. There is nothing secondhand here, no heresy. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there telling you of the things you can't see, the things of God? No one has ever gone up to the pres into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. And everyone who looks up to him trusting and expectant will gain a real life, eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his Son his one and only son. And this is why, so that one need, no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all that trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one of a, of a kind son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran from the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so that the work can be seen for the God work it is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word of truth. We thank you for the light that you give us through that word. Bless this time that we have together, Heavenly Father, as we learn more about what it means to let go of the old 
and put on the new. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> have, you ever heard, have you ever held a newborn baby? Anybody here ever held a newborn baby? You know, it's absolutely a wonderful experience. Holding a newborn baby, you look down at that child who has gone through nine months or thereabouts of being taken care of in a place where it didn't have to worry about food, shelter, water, warmth, cold, all just very natural. And then to be born into a hostile, cold world, born by pain. Pain not only for the mother giving birth, but pain for the child. Pain for the child. To be born into this world in pain. And the wonder of that child developing. Within that child develops then a personality that's unique to that individual. That uniqueness in that individual we call personality. And where does... What happens? What happens when this child is growing? This innocent little child grows up to be like you and me. What happens? We learn. We learn as we begin to grow what it means to be measured up by the world's standard. We learn what it means not to measure up because you're made fun of on the, on the playground. We learn what it means not to measure up because no, 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 you'll not be loved if you do that. We learn what it means to be in this human condition, in this condition known as sin. The self-absorbed I. The self-absorbed, self-inflicting, self-judging, self-made person that we're told we're supposed to be, right? Fortunately, we're not bound to that. Did you know that? We're not bound to that. We are free. We can put on the new. We can put on something totally new, not by any doing of ours, but by the doing of Jesus Christ. There is a new person, there is a new Robert, there is a new Howard, there's a new Dina, there's a new Beth, and it's nowhere like the old Beth, or the old Pastor Seuss, or the old Barbara. It is a new one, it is a new life that we have been given, a life that was born of the Spirit not of this world. The old life has died, is dying, will die. The new life is the life that we have in eternity. So when we are born again, we are born with a new life. And that's our acrostic for today. New life. And what does that mean? What does it mean to be born with a new life? One of the unique qualities that we have as humans is our capacity, our mind's capacity, to remember lots of things. Right? Some of us say we'd like to remember a lot more. But I submit to you that you probably remember more than you want to remember. Because when you're in the midst of living this new life that we've been given, what comes to mind is what we have learned in the past. In the new life that we have, we are to never look back. Never look back. Have you ever tried driving forward, looking in the rearview mirror? Don't try it. <clears throat> Don't try it. Don't try it on the highway anyway. Because you're sure to not see where you're going. 
And it's very important to see where you're going. And how often, though, do we as Christians not look ahead to the new life that he has given us, in the new life that he has given us, in the new vision that he has given us, how often do we go back to the old? How often do we say, okay, well, this is, this is just my lot in life. This is what I've been given. This is what I have to deal with. It's not. It's not. There is something new. There is a new way of thinking. He has given us a mind that in him develops fruit of the Spirit, a new mind that develops fruit of the Spirit. We don't have to look back. Nothing satiates our desire to go back to the womb, if you will. Think about that safe place. There's almost this primal urge that we have to be satisfied, to be cared for, to be loved unconditionally, to not have to do anything to earn our way. Well, that has been granted by Christ. That has been granted in this new life in him. We don't have to do anything to earn it. The things that we do are out of the joy because of what he's already done in our lives. So our new life is one of freedom from the things that have kept us bound. Our new life is one in which we can never look back. Because if we do, it'll take us away from where we are today and where we're going for the future. And folks, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about not only today, but the future and the journey that we're on. Now, <clears throat> simply because we don't have to look back doesn't mean that we aren't going to have little bumps along the way. So you can expect pain, expect growing pains, expect growing pains as we are growing up in him. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about putting off the, the thinking of a child and taking on the thinking of an adult. But even then, when we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, he says, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. The Christian life, according to C.S. Lewis, is not one devoid of pain. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is, it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. In the new life we have in Christ, we'll experience growing pains. You can count on it. You can count on it even today. Children, when they're growing, experience literal growing pains. No, this, this is not just a euphemism. Uh, when, when children experience rapid growth, it's, the, the bones may grow rapidly, the muscles are stretched. It's pain, it's painful. It's painful when we grow. So we can expect some growing pains in this new life that we have in Christ. What he, when he allows these pains to happen in our growth, it is not for our punishment. It is for our discipleship. It is the opportunity that he affords us to be able to build our character like his son. That's what this new life is like. It is like his son. We are called to a new life. The new life is Christ and to be like him. So all the pains, the growing pains that we experience are, folks, the opportunity to build our character like that of Christ. And it's all by the grace of God. The great preacher of the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon, said, there are no crown wearers in heaven who were not cross bearers on earth. You've heard no pain, no gain? <clears throat> it is through the pain that we gain the opportunity to be more like Christ. And <clears throat> 
the growth through the pain that we experience is best accomplished when we welcome his leading. Welcome his leading. There's an old hymn that goes something like this. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take my cross and follow. Follow me. And the, the chorus goes on, where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. You know, one of the mo most difficult things that we have to do as human beings is to be led. Because to be led means that I have to surrender my will to someone else's lead. Right? Now we all look for what, and, and we say, what we need in this country is good leadership. What we need in this church is good leadership. What we need is good leadership. Now what we need is good followership. Because we all want to lead the ship. And you can't all lead the ship. We can't all lead the ship. God is in the, the, at the helm. God is leading this ship. And the most difficult thing that we have to do is to surrender. Every four years, we elect new leaders in this country. And yet, we find it difficult to elect that we are going to follow the leader, the leader, who is the creator of the universe. The one who knows every nuance of all the little bits and pieces of protein in our bodies called DNA. That knew exactly the design that was going to happen before the world was created. Knew exactly your specific and my specific design. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that is a leader. That's someone I want to follow. And yet, we all have the same problem. We want to go back. We want to go back to what we thought was the life that we ought to have. And all the ways in which we don't measure up. All the ways in which we think we need to be doing things differently in order to be the success that the world has told us that we need to be. To have all the money that we, need, we think we need to have in order to take care of ourselves. I am a self-made person. Do you know what that all adds up to in, in the time of eternity? Diddly squat. That's, that's a new theological term. And to welcome his leading, folks, we need to lean on his promise. Lean on his promise. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, the life to the Father. Now, truth cannot lie. It's an oxymoron. Truth cannot lie. So what he tells us is the truth. And when he says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things we worry about are going to be taken care of, we can trust that that promise is true and that his word is steadfast. Do you hear that? When he says seek first his kingdom and all of his righteousness and everything else that we worry our little minds about, and sometimes our big minds about, will be taken care of. Because all of those things, all of those things that we worry about are going away. They're not here for eternity. But what he gives us in, the, in, in his kingdom is what is sustaining. It's what is real. It is what is everlasting. Paul reminded the folks at the church at Galatia 
that they were all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized in Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You're all one in Christ Jesus. So, there is, your, no, there is a unique quality that he has created in each one of us that is a part of his whole body part. But we are not differentiated by what we have, by how we look, by the color of our hair, whether we have it, or any of those other things. But by what he says we are. And we are all his. We are all one in him. Amen? Amen. Amen. If those folks are his promises, they're not mine. These are the promises from God, not mine. So put him first. And when we do, we can discover more about who we really are. And to discover more about who we really are, we need to inquire about our new nature. Inquire about our new nature. <clears throat> if I'm so busy living in the past, I miss the joy of the present and I thwart the journey for the future. Left to my own devices, I could find a thousand ways to put myself down, prove that I'm not good enough show you how I don't measure up. Oh, I could tell you all those things. Want to hear them? No. Because they don't matter. They don't matter. It's my judgment. It's my thought about myself. What matters is what God says about me. I cannot be left to my own devices, nor can you. You can't be left to your own devices because you get absorbed in the whole self thing. Now, how do we avoid being left to our own devices? There, there are three basic ways. The first is scripture. That is his word. His word is chocked full of assertions as to my new nature in Christ. Christ's life gives me a glimpse of who he is making me to be like. When I look at scripture and I read about Christ and what Christ did, it's not some ethereal past person that I am reading about. It is the person and the personality to which he is calling me and you and you and you daily. So it's important to spend time in his word. The second is the Holy Spirit. The second is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. The one who lives in us is instructing us in his ways. Do you know when we, are, when we accept Christ as our Savior, we have the Holy Spirit who comes to live with us. He comes and he lives in us. And he lives in us to greater or lesser degrees, depending upon how we squeeze him. He never insinuates himself where he's not welcomed. He says, I want all of you. I want all of you. Because I love all all of you, not just part of you. He wants to free us from that old part that we hang on to that says, I don't measure up, or my measure should be thus and so. When Jesus prayed the prayer to the Father, that they, his disciples, may be one with me as I am one with you, and likewise, those who will believe in the future, to be one with me as I am one with you. That's what he's calling us to. A oneness with him, with him. 
And the third way that we can avoid living with our own devices is the company of other saints. The company of other saints. And I don't mean Saint Teresa, and I don't mean Saint Sebastian, I don't mean those saints that have gone, but the saints that live right here. Because scripture says, because you believe, and because you have accepted Christ, and because you were a part of his body, you are among the saints. And we share together the sainthood of believers. There is a sainthood of believers. Now, if I am left to my own devices, I'm going to spiral into all of this negative stuff that I think about myself. If I come and fellowship with other believers, I am lifted up. If I come and I tell someone else, I need your prayers. I need your help. I don't even have to say why. But I can count on someone praying for me. I can count on there being someone there to hold me up. If I need someone to talk to and to hear me and to even help me realign my stinking thinking, then I can come to someone who also is a part of the body of Christ of which I am a member as well. So, those three things, Scripture, the Holy Spirit, and other saints, keep us from our own devices. And then, we need to free our thoughts from the old. Free our thoughts from the old. Behaviors, in case you haven't realized, behaviors have their origin in thought. Behavior has its origin in thought. We spend a lifetime cultivating bad habits and as a result, bad thinking. As the result of our bad thinking, I should say, we've, we've developed bad habits. So stinking thinking leads to stinking behavior. We want to change the way that we behave, we change the way we think. It's been said that first we build habits, then our habits build us. Ever tried to lose weight? Ever tried to stop smoking? Ever tried to do something in your own will? Why is it so hard? Mentally, I can change my mind, I can change my, ha my, my, uh, my thinking, but my habits are ruling me. So, we can free ourselves from the old, but we've got to go back and we've got to start looking at what we're thinking and start acting out of what we know to be the truth, not the lie that we've been buying all these years. 2 Corinthians 10.5 out of the message says, We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. In the NIV translation, it is, Take every thought captive. Take every thought captive. When I start thinking in a stinking way, I need to stop and say, what am I thinking? Why am I thinking? When I start behaving in a particular way, I need to stop and say, why am I thinking this behavior is going to get me something that it has never gotten me before? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, we've been told, is insanity. And yet we live insanely ambitious lives, believing that the same thing that we've always done is going to get us something different than what it's always gotten us. It can't happen. God wants us to grow up in our thinking. He wants us to allow him to build a character that's like that of his son. And you know that old thinking so often leads us to a place of behavior that says, I will preserve 
for myself this little part that I've carved out. In other words, let me act so that I don't lose. So that I don't lose something. When we, when we give ourselves over to Christ, he wants us given completely. Completely and totally. And yet we want to hang on. We want to hang on to this, that, or the other thing. Because we believe that if we do, it's going to mean something to us over time. Well, you know, that's deceiving because it, that leads to death. Life that we know leads to death. It will all be gone. Yesterday... A cousin of mine who's been a missionary in Japan for over 35 years now sent me an email, and in that email was a picture of my father and his ten, nine siblings. There were ten of them in the family. And she said it was taken um, in, in about 1940. And she, she said that another cousin had sent her in saying these were the ones who were identified. And they were wrong. So she wanted to know which ones were there. So I was able to name each one of them. And I knew exactly where it was taken. I remembered it well. And I remembered when it was taken. So it was not 1940. <laughs> <laughs> it was sometime after that. And I looked at the picture and I looked at my father and I looked at my uncles and my aunts. And I realized, I remembered all the things that were important to them. All the things that meant so much in their lives. Where are those things now? They're all dead, all ten. Not a single one survives, except with the Lord. Our lives, folks, are in eternity. They're not here. We're not bound here. We are free to live in the life that he has called us to for eternity, not just now. So freeing our thoughts from the past allows us to live to win the race for eternity. When Paul says, I will run the race, it's not running against someone else. It's running the, way, the race that I have to run in order to win. And it is not a race that says, because I have won it, or I have done this, that, or the other, I win. The race is won because I have become more like him. The race is won when I have become more like him. And the last thing that he calls us to do in this new life is to experience the joy of this new life. Experience the joy of who we are in him. Henri Nguyen said, Joy is the experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved. In our first sermon on love, we talked about the rock. Anybody remember what the rock was? The rock upon which we build, we're building the, the, this foundation for where we're going as a church. Recognizing our constant kinship, R-O-C-K, rock. Okay? That is the foundation upon which we build. That is our constant kinship to Jesus Christ as next of kin and heirs to the throne. Now I submit to you to enjoy the joy or to find the joy in living there, we need to lock onto that rock. And the lock means living out consistent kinship. Living out consistent kinship. How do you live out consistent kinship? 
never look back. Expect that there's going to be growing pains. Welcome his leading. Lean on his promises. Inquire about your new nature. Free your thoughts from the old and experience the joy of your salvation and your new life in him. Amen? Now, if there is anyone here who doesn't know what I mean by new life, then I'm going to ask you, would our elders raise your hands, please? Elders and deacons? Okay. Elders and deacons. Would you see one of these folks at the end of our service? Or come see me so that we can talk about what this new life is about? This is the first in a series of four sermons on who we are in Christ. We are new creations. We are new creatures. Not by virtue of anything we've done. Not because we're so deserving. But because we serve a living, loving God who gave his all for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for new life. We give you thanks for the renewed life that you give us every single day. For the breath that we have right now is by your grace. The sound that we hear, the voices we share, the thoughts that we possess, the heartbeat that we experience is all by your grace. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a new life that is not dependent upon any of that, but is the gift because of your son's submission to your will, to your glory, for our benefit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for doing for us for what Something that if we had lived, if we could live for eternity, we would never be able to earn. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.